What's going on smart people? In honor of Gauss's birthday, I thought it would be fun for today's daily video to be about how to solve everyone's favorite integral to look up, the Gaussian. Now we're going to be integrating just the regular e to the minus x squared, but towards the end I'll show you how to make substitutions in case you have other constants going on up top. I'll also show you how to fix different limits of integration, but for this video we're going to be integrating from negative infinity to infinity. We're going to set this up as follows. Integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the minus x squared dx. This is the poster child Gaussian integral. Now, if this is your first time coming across this integral, I challenge you to show for yourself that using conventional methods like u substitution or integration by parts, just don't cut it for this integral. So feel free to pause the video and try to tackle this integral by yourself and see for yourself that this is a different beast. Now the general way of going about solving this is to be a little clever. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a new function, psi as a function of y, and it's gonna be the same functional form as this. So it's gonna be e to the minus y squared. Now these are the exact same function. They both span the same space, or the same type of space within their own spaces. One is in the x axis, one is in the y axis. The thing that makes them contribute different amounts is the limits of integration that you place on them. So if you place the same limits on these functions, you can treat them as the same function. What I'm getting at with that is if we were to multiply this integral times the integral of this function, so times negative infinity, infinity, e to the minus y squared dy, since these both have the same functional form and they're both integrated over the same amount of space, this is the same thing as the integral of psi of x from negative infinity to infinity squared. That's what I'm getting at with this. We're going to get the same answer if we treat these as two different functions being multiplied together and integrated, or the same function integrated and then squared. So the key point here is to keep in mind that we're going to be solving this integral now, but treating it as this. So we're going to remember that this is really going to correspond to the first integral squared. But we can rewrite this integral and make it a little bit prettier. We're going to keep the same limits of integration, negative infinity, infinity, negative infinity, infinity. And we're going to exploit the fact that we can use, say, e to the a times e to the b is equal to e to the a plus b. Using this relationship, we can combine these two exponents as e to the minus x squared minus y squared dx dy, right, because we're just adding these two exponents to each other. Next, we're just going to factor out a factor of minus 1 from this integral, and that's going to become same limit still, e to the minus x squared plus y squared. This is where this should start to look a little familiar. So now we have this. Uh, so now we have this new integral, and what we're going to do is we're going to transform into polar coordinates, and we're going to do so by remembering that r, the radius, is equal to x squared plus y squared. And if we make this substitution, then we're going to have something in terms of e to the minus r squared. So if we write this out a little bit, we get. I'm not going to put the limits yet, I'm just going to write this as e to the minus r squared. And at first glance, that doesn't look any better, because at first it was just integrating e to the minus x squared. But when we convert into polar coordinates, the measure changes. So dx dy becomes r dr d theta. So we've got to multiply this thing by this, so we've got r dr d theta. And now we have to figure out what our limits of integration are. Now, if we want to span the xy plane, it makes sense for x to go from negative infinity to infinity as well as y. But if we want to span the polar plane, we don't have to go from negative infinity to infinity with r. What we can do is we can stretch infinitely far out from some fixed point 0, r equals 0, out to infinity, and then rotate that by 360 degrees. And what that's telling us is that r is going to go from 0 to infinity, and theta is just still going to go from 0 to 2 pi. Therefore, we're still covering the same amount of ground that we were going from negative infinity to infinity in the xy plane, and now we have something that looks a bit different. And what we can do here is we can finally use a more conventional method of integrating. We can use u substitution. So if we let 
u equal e to the minus r squared, then du is just going to equal minus 2r e to the minus r squared dr. Now that's close, but we don't quite have the same thing here. But if we divide by minus 2 here, we get minus 1 half du is equal to e to the minus r squared. Oops. Uh, r dr. And now we have something that matches up perfectly. So that tells us that every time we see e to the minus r squared r dr, we put in du. Okay, great. So now we can make our substitutions in. We're going to go integral. Every time we see this, we can just put in du, minus one half du. So we have minus or e to the minus r squared r dr e to the minus r squared r dr. That is defined as minus one half du. So we got minus one half du. Uh, there's no dependence of theta here. So theta is still going from zero to two pi. And since our integrand doesn't have any theta dependence, this is just gonna integrate to two pi. Okay, so we can just say that this is just going to be multiplied by two pi at the end. Oops, two pi. 2 pi times this. Now what happens to our limits of integration when we switch to u? So at first we're going from r equals 0. Well, if r equals 0, that means that u is equal to 1 because we have e to the 0. Anything to the 0 power is 1. And then we're going from r equals 0 to r equals infinity. If r is infinity, well, this whole thing goes smaller and smaller and smaller, so that goes to 0. Okay, so we're going from u equals 1 to 0. We can go ahead and cancel out this 2 real quick. So we got a factor of minus pi out front. Now when you have a symmetric uh, function that you're integrating against, you can swap limits of integration by multiplying by minus 1. So I'm going to do that real quick. So I'm going to change this from 0 to 1 instead of from 1 to 0 because it's easier for me to think that way. And when we do that, we multiply the whole thing by minus 1. That cancels this. So now we just have an integral from 0 to 1. That looks a bit more familiar. And then when we integrate this, well, that's just going to give us a factor of 1 minus 0. So we get pi. Great. Now remember, this whole thing corresponds to psi of x, well the integral of psi of x dx squared. That means that the integral of psi of x dx from negative infinity to infinity is equal to the square root of this, square root of pi. Ta-da! <laughs> Now that's great, we know how to solve the conventional Gaussian integral now, but what if our limits are a little bit different? What if, say, instead of from negative infinity, this should have been a negative the whole time, if instead of negative infinity to infinity for both x and y, we both start at zero? How does that change everything? Because one of the things with transforming into different coordinates and things like that is keeping track of how your limits change. So if we want to go from zero to zero, or zero to infinity, same thing's going to happen. This is still going to go. Nothing changes here. This is still going to go this e to the minus r squared r dr d theta. But now we have, remember, r is equal, r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So if x and y are 0, then that means r starts at 0. But that's, that's nothing different here. Um, so that doesn't change. The thing that changes is going to be the theta part. Because if we were to graph out what we're looking at, we're saying here's y, here's x. We're saying x starts from 0 and goes to infinity. And we're saying y goes from 0 to infinity, which means we're only looking at this region here which means that the, the angle that we're integrating about just goes from 0 to pi over 2 now. 
and then everything else is the same. You just end up multiplying by a factor of pi over 2 at the end instead of a factor of 2 pi. Now if you're taking a course in quantum mechanics or something, there's normally some parameter in the exponent that you're allowed to tweak uh, at the end of whatever quantum problem you're solving. So it's going to look like a Gaussian, but it's going to be scaled to some degree in the exponent. So I want to show you real quick how to make a substitution to make it still fit the form that we've been solving. So say instead of what we had before, we're given psi of x is equal to e to the minus x squared over b. Now that's not quite the same thing, but what we can do is we can define some new variable, let, I don't know, x prime, prime not meaning derivative, just being another dummy variable, x prime equal to x over the square root of b. Now if we square this, we get x prime squared is equal to x squared over b. And now we're just going to start integrating with respect to x prime. So if we do that, the integral goes from, let's see, so it's going to be e to the minus x prime squared dx prime. Since the difference between these two is just being multiplied by some constant, that's not going to change the infinities anywhere. And there we're back to the same integral that we just solved. So that's how you can make substitutions to make it fit the form that we just solved for. Now this is going to make it so that you don't get that factor of root pi anymore. It's going to be scaled by some factor of b. But you can make that substitution at the end of the problem. And there you go. I hope you guys found this video helpful. I definitely had fun making it. I love making these more math related videos. Let me know in the comment section if you did. And I'll see you guys there.